If you want to change your life, it begins right here every single morning. There is a l powerful skill that I want you to learn. It's simple, it's not easy, and here it is. When that alarm rings, you have got to get out of bed. Look, I know there's a million reasons not to get out of bed. Right now, this morning, I can think of a bunch. It's 40 degrees, raining, disgusting, cold, depressing outside. I feel tired. My bones feel heavy. I have a lot of work to do, and it's uh, stressing me out a little bit. None of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters when it comes to changing your life is, can you keep a promise to yourself? Can you keep a promise to yourself when it feels uncomfortable? Can you keep a promise to yourself when suddenly you don't want to? Can you keep a promise to yourself when it'd be easier not to? That is the core skill that you need to change any area of your life. Because change doesn't require motivation, it requires discipline. You need the discipline to do what you said you were gonna do. And I want you to think about this. When you set an alarm, setting an alarm the night before is an act of making a promise to yourself. Setting alarm, which I do, I get up between 6.15 and 6.45 every day. I am making a promise to myself that I am going to get up when that alarm rings. And if I can't keep a promise to myself because I don't feel like it, I'm cranky, I'm not a morning person, whatever the hell your excuse is, you're not going to be able to keep promises to yourself in any area of your life where you feel uncomfortable, where it's easier to avoid conflict, where you succumb to your excuses, where you soothe yourself instead of pushing through. And I mean this. All change happens the same way with discipline. All change begins with the decision to change. All change begins with making and keeping promises. So regardless of what you're working on, if you're working on boundaries, if you're working on saying no, if you're working on pushing yourself through discomfort, you can start to practice the skill of showing up for yourself no matter what by simply setting the alarm the night before for the, when the time you actually need to get up. And when that time comes and that alarm rings and it's time to keep that promise, no matter what you're feeling, your number one job is to keep that promise to yourself. You start to practice this skill of setting the alarm and looking at it as a promise that you're making to yourself and when that alarm rings, not succumbing to your excuses or your feelings of discomfort, but actually getting up and keeping that promise, you start to do that, your whole life will change. And the reason why is all change is the same. It's about making and keeping small promises. And the more that you do it in one area of your life, the easier it's going to be for you to do it in any other area of your life. Trust me. It's exactly how I've changed my life. I started here. Alarm rings, get out of bed, start your day, go. So I think the word discipline is scary. I think it's very scary and it's very and it's difficult. intimidating. And so I prefer to practice what I call simple discipline. Okay, what is that? And we're already writing a book on it, so nobody can steal that idea, right? Oh. Um, so, because uh, I saw your eyes light up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's literally that you can create discipline in your life by doing two 45-minute workouts, one of them outside every day. Mm -hmm. You can also create discipline in your life by getting up when the alarm rings. Mm, like small, like small yes, wins. Yes, making your bed. Um. I also lay my exercise clothes mm -hmm. out in my closet, which I have to walk through to get to the bathroom. It's like a trap on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I if I don't, if I step over it, I'm basically going, screw you, Mel. But by laying it out, I am able to exercise a muscle of simple discipline. It's an environmental trigger. It's right there. I'm reminding myself that, and I pull it on. I walk into the bathroom. I stand in front of the sink as I'm brushing my teeth. And I set an intention for the day. And I raise my hand and high five myself as a way to practice simple discipline, as a way to show myself support and love and celebration, no matter what I'm facing in life, the good and the bad, as a way to be present, 
as a way to send myself into the game of life with a little bit of momentum mm -hmm. behind me instead of feeling like I'm dragging a freaking boulder behind me. Uh, another way to practice simple discipline is drinking a half a gallon of water a day. Another way to practice simple discipline is to put your hands on your heart whenever you feel your nervous system going up. You could be in the grocery store and some jerk cuts you off and grabs the last box of the bolo granola and now you're all <laughs> angry because you wanted it. You feel it up to sky, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. Like those sort of little things that flood your nervous system are ruining your life because none of us realize how much your nervous system being dysregulated. I can see it. you're getting emotional. Why? Why? Oh, no, I'm not getting emotional. I just think I, I totally agree You have this look in your you. eyes where your eyes get really like beautiful and watery. Oh, really? Yeah. I, thank you. That's just natural because I wasn't actually, I'm just actually agreeing with so many things yeah. that you're saying. And I'm really big on, and what I, what I do a lot is I do what you do. I put certain things in my day to make sure they happen because mm -hmm. I know that I don't like to drink water. So then I won't allow myself to get out of bed until I drink a huge glass of water. Having, um, now look, I've only really practiced this for a day. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not exactly the world's best expert at this. And this wasn't even my idea. My husband knows that with my ADD and dyslexia yeah. and dysgraphia and everything else under the sun that you can put a label on, that me getting a gallon of water in to me is going to be a challenge. And so he basically said, you've got to drink two 16 ounces. Yeah before you have a cup of coffee. Yeah, that's exactly what I and do. And so that little hack has helped me a lot. And But you also, it, for someone who has no- For a day. I'll let you know tomorrow how it's oh, going. Or, or yes, I'm going to check <laughs> in I'm with you. But I'm traveling. I mean, yeah, like that's I was That's the thing. In, you travel a lot. Where were we yesterday? Uh, oh, Utah. I was in Salt Lake yesterday. Mm. We're in LA today. We're in San Francisco tomorrow. Uh, so how do you stay on, on, like, how do you stay discipline, on point? Similar, I make my bed in a hotel. You do? Yes, because- you want to be who you are no matter where you That's are. That's true. You want to be who you are no matter who you're around. So if I'm somebody that yeah. always wakes up when the alarm rings, I don't set my alarm for the same time every morning. That's why I stumbled when you asked me that question. Yeah, I was going to say, so Here's what time why. around? I sit, uh, before I go to bed at night, I think about my day. Mm -hmm. And I go, when do I need to set this for so that I'm supported in the morning? Mm -hmm. This morning is the perfect example of me doing a terrible job at that. Because I thought to myself, oh, okay, well, uh, I've got my first thing at eight o'clock. I've got to get in a 45 minute workout. I forgot the fact that I'm going to want to have a cup of coffee. And mm -hmm. the fact that I've drank 32 ounces of water means I'm going to spend more time in the bathroom. 100%. I also discounted the fact that we're here in Los Angeles and my daughter goes to the Thornton School of Music at U USC. And she was oh. going to be swinging by coming from a party at one o'clock in the morning, which meant that I was going to then stay up and talk to her. And then that meant that I would wake up extra tired, right. which means I probably needed a half an hour longer than I did. Wow. And so yeah. I kind of screwed myself over by setting my alarm for six o'clock in the morning. Right. But you were, you reverse engineer your day. Yeah, yeah, I do. And so every day it's different. And normally I'm really good because I put in the time to have about 15 minutes of just kind of flex time to get from my bedroom out into the kitchen or wherever. I always exercise in the morning if I can. And what do you kind of ex exercise besides walking if the dog? If I have no time, yeah. I drop into a two minute plank mm -hmm. um, or I'll use a Tabata app and do the kind of 20, 15 for four minutes. Okay. Um, or I can now do jumping jacks because I've had bladder surgery. So even jumping jacks for two minutes. You can, you could do them now. Yeah, I can okay, do Okay, good, now. good. Um, after three kids, it was kind of an issue. Yeah, I could. And then, um, but if I have time, I always either do a uh, stream of yoga class or I go for a hike. I don't really run anymore. I'll go for a power walk. I will uh, jump on a Peloton, that kind of, I, I love bar class. So if like, do you have like a time? So it doesn't matter what time, as long as you do some form of activity. I like to try to get done in the morning. Because no, how has, long? Like you try to do like a 45 minute, doesn't matter. As if long I actually walk into the studio, I win. Yeah. I mean, I... I, most yoga classes are an hour, most More. bar classes are 50 minutes. Uh, but I, I, you know, I used to never be somebody, I've practiced yoga for 20 years, never once laid out a mat at home. And the pandemic yeah. changed my life. So I now barely go to a yoga studio because I can then just stream it. Right. Yeah. And so you do that every morning before, do you, that, that's a non-negotiable for you, right? You exercise. If I don't do it in the, if I, if I don't get a yoga class in, I will do a plank or I'll do abs. And just a, just a plank for two minutes and then you, that, that's 
That's enough. That's okay. enough for me. Okay. I mean, it might not be enough for you, but I mean, that's pretty fr- freaking hard. <laughs> no, no, no. Two minutes is a great plank. I'm just saying, like, so it's about work. When I when you said working, and out. and it didn't start with like, like it was two minutes with the knees on the ground. And no, no, no. I know. I, well, I didn't say not. I don't not. I know, but I was saying that. So See, does here's it- the thing. I love keeping my word. Yeah. And so one of the things that trips everybody up. Yeah. As you say, I have to have an hour plus 15 That's minutes right. commuting time each way. Mm-hmm. Imagine how much your life would change if you literally ratcheted that down to, I need to walk outside for 10 minutes. Yeah, totally. And you do that every day for a month. And you just experience the life-changing magic of keeping your promise to yourself and having a little bit of simple discipline in your life. Because when you start to see yourself acting in a way mm-hmm. that is aligned with the person you want to become, you start to really shift who you're becoming. It's through the actions. That's why this high five habit is so powerful. Mel, I can see how when somebody really starts to do this work and begins doing the high five on a regular basis, starts to form that better relationship with themselves. If perfectionism was something that they've struggled with, I think this this could be impacted in a positive way by finding that love for yourself. So I'd love for you to talk for about sure. that. For sure. Are you a perfectionist? I am a perfectionist, yes. Why? I care about the quality of of the work I do and I take pride in it and I I I mean it's it's I'm I big don't on, call that perfectionism. I don't think that's perfectionism. I'm big on continuing to improve 1% at a time and and yeah, so I guess it depends on the definition, but I very much care about the quality of the work I do and inside well, inside can... being an entrepreneur and outside. Well, I think you, if I had to take a guess, you probably care about it because you care about the impact. Big time. I, ob- I obsess over the littlest details like what's the title on a video? What's the font we're using? Because I'm thinking, and I know based on data, that when you get it right, it reaches 100x people. And so it's not about the perfectionism for the sake of being perfect. It's about the artistry and the impact and the reach I want to have. 100%. Perfectionism, great. So you and I have a level of intentionality and discipline to the way we do our art. Perfectionism is a paralyzing level of overthinking that keeps you from starting or finishing or showing up. And if you are a perfectionist, I wanna tell you something life-changing. You are not a perfectionist, you're just afraid. You're afraid of failing. You're afraid of getting it wrong. You're afraid of the criticism that comes with it. You're afraid of being seen as a failure. You're afraid of not knowing and what that means. This goes all the way back to that moment in the mirror. Perfectionists are so insanely hard on themselves. They have what psychologists call a bias of overthinking. And many perfectionists grew up with a parent that was very critical or unpredictable. And so the perfectionism comes as a coping mechanism as a child of needing to get it perfect because you would either be criticized or you would get a negative reaction from your parent if you didn't get it right. And so it can be very crippling. And what I want you to understand is you can repair this with the high five habit. Because when you stand in front of the mirror and you start to high five yourself every day as part of this ritual of showing up for yourself and of high fiving and celebrating yourself. Even remember what my daughter said, even on the days where you didn't exercise and you didn't write that song and you didn't get the thing done and you didn't do what you said you were do, or your boss was sort of weird with their tone of voice. When you can continue to support and celebrate yourself in those moments, you are mending that damage that got done to you as a child. And you are building up this ability to do what courage requires. And that's being willing to try again, being willing to start, being willing to make a mistake, 
being willing to face somebody's disappointment and rejection and know that you're going to be okay. That's how you address it. And one thing I find really helpful for me as somebody who really does care about the quality of the work and the reach and helping people, and I'm sure you probably feel the same, is that having a deadline can be so helpful. With this show, for instance, it goes out every Tuesday. The final Thursday of each month, we put a fifth episode out. It's like I have that day that I have to have everything in line, and it's going out. Like there's no if, ands, or buts. Like we're going to get it as good as we can. We're going to put it out on that day. And if the schedule of release was just kind of, you know, organic and when we get it done, quote unquote, I think we'd put out a lot less shows. Yeah. yeah. So I think deadlines for people that are, you know, working on, on perfectionism, obviously do the, the, the high fiving and, and work on yourself, but having a a solid deadline has been helpful to me. What about yourself? Well, Yeah. Um, You know, in chapter 10, which I think might be my favorite chapter in the book, it's the chapter with the Uber driver, Antonio, who is struggling with procrastination, which is also just a form of fear, by the way. He wants to move to California, and little did he know, he got the ass kicking he needed by having me in the backseat of the car. And it's an incredible story. And to your point, Jesse, it's about creating a runway. Because if you don't set a short deadline of what have you been thinking about forever, and can we set a deadline of three weeks from now of when you're going to get started so that this three-week period is you taking action to prepare yourself to get started, that is a hack that helps you break the overthinking and the procrastination habit and actually get moving toward the thing you want. An important point you touched on there to highlight is like, if somebody has a big goal, say they want to, I know for you, your big goal is you want to get your podcast going. (laughs) And for somebody say that's their goal or YouTube channel, or they want to, you know, give this big presentation at work or whatever it is, it's setting deadlines on pieces of that because it could be so overwhelming to say like, I want to have this, this podcast and have 10 episodes ready to go and you can get I'm caught show you, something. you can get caught up in and it being so overwhelming. So it's like have deadlines to pieces of that big goal and then it's so much more manageable. Well, and there's something else that happens. And it's actually I realize similar to why the high five works. So, I'm going to write down a deadline. I've been thinking about doing a podcast for 8 years. I got my start in the media business and radio. I have been kicking myself in the ass for eight years. And everybody that launches a podcast, you know, I get the, in, I get the inquiry from the Ultimate Health Podcast and I feel this sting of jealousy and regret. Because I'm like, of course, Jesse's done it. I can't even do it. Now there's two million of them. I'm too late. I'm just a copycat. I don't have any, like I have the same garbage that everybody else has. When you live in your head, you will stay stuck there. And Jesse's a genius in this regard because a deadline does something really interesting. When you give yourself permission to have what you desire, and for me, it's to launch a podcast. I want to get away from being on big stages and traveling like crazy, and I want to anchor down and really go all in on a podcast as the central hub of what I'm doing. Um, I've been thinking about it for eight years. Thinking about something doesn't get it done. When you write down the deadline, and this says January 2022, I realize it's reversed on the camera, but January 2022, I've now pulled it out of my mind and I've made it a physical thing in the world. And when I put this up on the bulletin board, that this is it, like this is the moment when I will say, what do I do? I host a podcast. I write books and I host a podcast. Um, it starts to, the runway appears. And that's how you do it. And the same thing with the high five. You can stand in your head all you want and think this stuff. But the second you take physical action, you bring it out of your head and you make it a reality in the world. And that's the genius of setting a short, simple deadline of when you are going to get started. So for you, Mel, you're confirming here, January 2022, the show will be launched. 
I didn't. I don't know about the show being launched, but I will be starting the launch of a show. Beautiful. I don't know if it'll be live yet, but yes, that'll be the number one project that I have started. And between now and then, I can prepare. And what is one of the things that I'm going to do? I'm going to reach out to Jesse and I'm going to ask if he'll spend a half an hour on the phone with me and give me advice on what he would do differently or what he does now. And I'm going to learn and I'm going to get myself ready. I'd love to. And I'd love to jump on and do another interview like this and and be part of announcing the launch of the new show and awesome. helping project awesome. that into the world. Well, thank you. And I love I love what you said there, Mel, too, about focus on that being one of the big things you're doing. Because for the success of the show, the podcast that we're doing here, a big part of that I feel is because it is my focus. I think a lot of people mm. often, you know, take on a bunch of different projects and kind of half commit to them. But for me, like I was a chiropractor when I started the show with my wife seven years ago. And it was a side project. And over time, it gained momentum and, and it got to the point where it could support us. And we ended up pivoting out of our previous careers. Long story short, this is what I do. And when people say, what do you do? It's I do this podcast and I take it very seriously. Again, coming back to the perfectionism or whatever you want to call it. But I think focus- no, it's the precision, precision. You have precision. Right. You're, you're a chiropractor. Yeah. It's in your DNA to be precise. That's killer. For me, it's like, this is what I do. It's what I love to do. I put my focus, my energy on it. And I'm curious for you, because you've accomplished so much and done so many different things, how integral, when you take something on and succeed at it, how integral is it that you're focused in? Well, I think that, uh, you know, money, energy, all of it goes, it flows to where your attention goes. So directing your attention in a very mindful way is critical to success and happiness. It's one of the reasons why I don't sleep with my phone because, um, you know, this sucker right here is a tool in my business and it's a tool that helps me stay connected to people that I love. It's a tool that helps me communicate. But you got to be very careful because you can become the tool. So I have huge boundaries with this sucker, even though it's super important to me. And I, um, I feel like one of the hardest questions to answer is one of the most important ones to ask yourself all the time, and it's this. What do I actually want my life to look like? What do I actually want my life to look like? You know, in the book, I talk about a high-five life and having a high-five attitude. And if there are aspects of your life that you don't want to high five right now, that is a wake up call that it's time to sit with yourself. And as you start practicing the high five habit and you start empowering and encouraging and loving yourself where you are and supporting yourself every step of the way, every day, and that's how you start your day, sit with yourself and ask yourself, what do you actually want your life to look like? You've just heard Jesse say that he leaned into an interest and it, of podcasting while he was doing something else, and now it's become his life. You can change. 13 years ago, I was waking up hungover, anxiety-ridden, $800,000 in debt and unemployed, on the verge of a divorce and losing it all. And now I sit before you as one of the best-selling authors in the world one of the most booked motivational speakers in the world. And even I am changing the answer to the question, what do I want my life to look like? And so every day that you wake up, you have an opportunity to either criticize yourself or support yourself, to either hate yourself or love yourself. You have an opportunity to drag yourself through a life that you can't stand or to take control one day at a time, to sit with yourself and answer the question, what do I want my life to look like? To set small deadlines for when you're going to get started, to five, four, three, two, one, and high five yourself forward and start doing the work to change your habits and to take the actions that will lead you toward the things that you desire. And the very first step is just giving yourself the time and permission to sit down and focus on what that answer actually is for you. 
I love that you brought up the what do I want my life to look like because I'm a big advocate of this as well. And I can see through and hear through what you're saying, you're using this to, you know, guide your upcoming path to have a podcast. I heard you mention you don't want to be touring as as much and speaking in person. So you're looking yeah. at what do I want my life to look like? What do I need to do? This podcast is part of that solution. Exactly. So I love that we can use that example and, and highlight that. Mel, this has been a lot of fun. I know our time is up here. Other than the listeners and viewers getting a copy of the High Five Habit, how can they connect with you after the show? Well, do the High Five Challenge. Let me high five you back. Let me coach you and encourage you and celebrate you for five days. Come be a part of the hundreds of thousands of people that are going to be cheering you on because right now that's exactly what you need. You're listening to Jesse, you're a fan of the Ultimate Health Podcast because you want more for your life. And research shows that, yes, you can change on your own, but it's so much more fun and it happens faster when you're doing it with a bunch of other like-minded people. So come on over. It's free. You got nothing to lose. I got your back. And it would be amazing for us to partner with you and high-five you every step of the way as you turn your life toward what you want next. All right, Mel, going to link that up in the show notes. And I know part of the story we don't have time to get into here, but the last book, the way it was launched, it did end up making the New York Times bestseller list. This time, I know you're going to be factoring everything in. And I know this one. I, you know, honestly, I don't care. Let me tell you something. Okay. This is so important. Yeah. I, I, would it be nice if we make a bestseller list? That would be great. It would be really great. It would make my ego feel good. It would mean a lot of things happen, like mainstream press finds out about it. More people talk about it. That would be wonderful. But here's what I know. The goals that you have and the dreams that you have are not necessarily meant to be achieved. They have a specific purpose. And the purpose is to pull you through your self-doubt and your resignation and inspire you to move toward them. And what I have learned in my life over and over and over again is that it's not in the achieving of the thing that the magic happens. It's in the doing of the thing. Because ultimately you bump into something bigger and better that was meant for you along the way of pursuing it. And so it's really important for everybody to hear the five-second rule I self-published. It is the most successful audiobook in the history of self-published audiobooks. It has sold more than 2 million copies, which is unheard of for a self-published book. It is in 33 or 35 languages and counting in four years flat. It has never made a bestseller list in the traditional sense. It is not carried in most bookstores. And you talked about focus. I'm focused on making an impact. And that book and the five second rule has helped more than 111 people stop themselves from attempting suicide by counting five, four, three, two, one. My intention for this book and my intention for this podcast is that it cracks something open inside you. It makes a huge impact. And so when you focus on that, It'd be fucking awesome if we made lists. It'd be awesome if everybody and their mother talks about it. It'd be awesome if everybody on the planet knows it and we get recognized for it. But if it, the trade-off is all of those validations outside of it or the impact that I really want to make, I would take the impact, and I know you would too, all damn day long. What is your secret to staying young at heart and young in your mind. Staying connected. Staying connected to your friends, old friends. Um, I've always had a man in my life. I've been very gotcha. lucky about that. <laughs> what does that mean? I've always had a man in my life. Because how long were you married? 45 years. He died of cancer. How old were you? 68. Okay. And uh, about a year and a half later, I met a man. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I'd fallen in love. And my children thought it was way too early for me to be have a man in my life. I didn't feel that way. Well, 
you're not one of my boys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Chris felt that way either. Well, the other two did. And, uh, but they, I don't think they remembered that Ken was sick for two years. That's true. So I was alone for two years as far as having someone loving me. Yep. So I was with Bill uh, for a while, and uh, we had our differences. And after two years, we went our separate ways. And soon after that, I met another guy who is local. And, you know, Hans and I were together for 10 years. 10 years? Yeah, can you believe that? No. Yeah, we were. Wow. But he's the nicest, sweetest man, as you know. Yes, but he just him. doesn't have the energy that I have. Yeah. And I was constantly, you know, arranging all our social life and all our trips. We did a lot of traveling, but it was, I was the one that was doing it. Mm. And so I eventually got him to move back into his own house and then down the line into a retirement community, which he's very happy, and I still see him, and we're very good friends. Yes, I very love good him. friends. We love hands. And then I met another guy who's in town, and actually it was me who met John. Yeah. I mean, I knew John, but I saw him at uh, <laughs> I saw him at this artist thing. You were there. Oh, this is when I first moved here, and I was yeah. having constant anxiety yeah. and hating my life, and yeah, yeah. thinking I've I have. I'm now going to a place where people live when they're about to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that's where you met him. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't meet him. I already knew him. Okay. But um, something else was happening later in the week. I don't know, some concert or something. And I so I just went up to John and I said, would you like to go? And he said, yeah. But he also had a girlfriend in Canada. So that went on for a while. And then he gave her up. <laughs> and he picked you up. Yeah. And so we're together, and he makes me very happy. And he has a lot of energy, and he organizes everything. Like Amazing. going to a dude ranch. We just got back from a dude ranch, as you know. Yes. So 85 years old, the two of you go off on your first trip together, and you go to a dude ranch in Montana, where I understand you are learning how to herd cattle on horseback. Yeah, we did. We did a cattle drive. It was awesome. And you're not like a horse person. This is not well, like no. a thing. Well, how long had it been since you had truly been on a horse, though? So? I don't know, 40 years. All right, so staying connected. But this goes, be, but you went for long periods of time not in relationships, though. No, and I actually... I probably started seeing Hans about a month after I broke up with oh, Bill. Jesus, Judy. <laughs> wow. So okay. you see, I haven't been alone. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> oh, you're funny. Yeah, no, I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate that way. You yeah. Know? Well, you create what you want. Yeah. And you put yourself out there. And I also notice that connection to friends is very important. Extremely important. So how did you stay so connected to your friends when your friends literally live all over the world? Well, I actually, Mel, I have to give you some credit here. Me? Yes, you. Because after Ken died, and I didn't have anybody in my life, and I'll never forget this either. This is before you started into the business. I rented a, an apartment in New York, as you remember. Oh, yeah by myself, which was a kind of a lonely experience, actually, because I would went to dinner by myself. and um, But of course, as soon as people realized I had an apartment, they started coming. <laughs> but it's still, being in a big city alone can be very lonely. Right, because you see people everywhere. Yeah. But I was right next to the Hudson River, so I was running and I took my bike. Mm -hmm. So I stayed active physically. But I remember mentioning to you that I was going to go to Florida. I didn't know, you know, what I was going to do. And you said to me, pick up the phone and call some of your friends and make sure you have something on your calendar before you hit the ground in Florida. Mm. I'll never forget that. And it made a difference because I had something to look forward to. Yeah. 
Otherwise, I just had a blank slate, and I probably could have felt pretty sorry for myself. Yeah. But even, even beyond that, you have kept in close touch with your women friends. Yes, I, it's very important to do that. And how do you do that? You pick up the phone and call them. Um, you know, it's... So many people go around the back door. And I'm going to give you an example. I have a good friend who has Alzheimer's, mm. and she's young. And she admitted that she has Alzheimer's. So she's very open about it. Yep. And she recently, her husband got her on the new drug, the Alzheimer's drug by Biogen, this winter. He was very glad that he did, and she was glad that she was on it. Three days ago, she went out to lunch with a very good friend of mine and said to her friend and my friend, you know, I just had a physical, and I'm 100% all right. I don't have Alzheimer's. Really? So, obviously, she's coming all the way around into the denial, oh. which she wasn't before. So this is, when I, this is my point. Shirley said, do you think I should call Marsha? And tell her, Marsha being a good friend of yeah. hers. And I said, well, why would you do that? Why don't you call Bob, her husband? Why don't you go directly to Bob? He might already know that she said that, but he might not. And say to him, I just had lunch with Connie, and this is what she said. And this is what's so important in life, is that if you have a good friend that you want to talk to, talk to them. Don't talk to your other friend that's a friend of your friend. Right. You know, if you want to talk to somebody on the phone, call them. And I don't think a lot of people do that. They talk about their friends, but they don't talk to their friends. That's right. Yeah. If you're thinking about somebody, pick up the phone and call them. If you have something that you're concerned about, pick up the phone and call them. Don't talk about what you're concerned about. Well, with we have another else. friend that ha is now into dementia, but is not admitting it. And the scary thing is that they're thinking maybe her husband has it too. And I haven't said anything, but I'm thinking that I need to go to Sally and say to her, are you worried about yourself? Because everybody's talking about her, but nobody's talking to her. And maybe she would say to me, what are you talking about? I'm fine. Right. Or maybe she'd break down and say, it's true. I, I don't know what I'm really doing. Yeah. Because she doesn't. Wow. <sighs> there was one other thing that I would love to touch on because service has been such an enormous part of your life and volunteering. After your husband of 45 years, Ken, died, you moved to Cambodia. Well, I didn't move. Well, what did you do? <laughs> you did something that is just incredible. Well, I went on a bike trip to, to Vietnam, and I visited Cambodia, and I fell in love. I fell in love with the people in Cambodia. Mm. So I said, and I was with Bill at the time, I said, I'm going to come back here and teach English. And so I got a hold of this NGO, Cambodia Living Arts, and asked them if they could find me someplace where I could teach, which is really quite ballsy since I don't know anything about teaching. I just know <laughs> <laughs> I know how to talk English or speak. I know she <laughs> talks English well, everybody. <laughs> but that's it. Anyway, um, yeah, they got me a position in this school that um, the kids go to a regular school, but they come here to mm -hmm. learn English mm -hmm. after school. Yep. And I mean, I had monks in that class. I had mothers in that class. I mean, I had, oh my God, it was hysterical. And you've heard me say this. This was quite an experience. How many years did you go to Cambodia? Six. Six years. You'd live there for almost three months and yeah. teach seven days a week. Plus your daughter came. And our daughter, in when she was in eighth grade, went over and... Fell in love. Fell in love, and she's actually on her way back because of that experience as we speak. Wow. Um, what? Talk to us about staying young at heart. 
I mean, because every, at the heart of every one of these stories, there's very similar themes. You have to create what you want in your life. Right. You, connection is incredible. And you have this wonderful sense of humor about you where you just try it. Like you don't even stop yourself <laughs> and think, well, how's this going to work? I'm moving to Cambodia. I'm 69 years old. I'm going to do this alone. Am I like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, what, how is this going to work? Where, where am I going to? You just are like, okay, let's do this. We're going to figure it out. So how do you stay young at heart? What do you think that's about? <clears throat> Well, I go back again about living in the moment. Mm. And I I don't take any day for granted that I have. I mean, I'm really grateful for every day I have. Yeah. And that's the only thing I can say. I mean, I think most people live their lives like, well, of course they'll be tomorrow. Mm. There was yesterday, they'll be tomorrow, they'll be next week, I can do this, I can do that. Well, who's to say? We have a friend who just was on his motorcycle, bingo. Yeah. Um, so that keeps me um, positive because I'm grateful. I'm, I'm so grateful. First of all, I have a fabulous life. I have an incredible family, all these grandchildren. I'm not sick. You know, I'm healthy. I have all my knees and all my hips, so... I'm very grateful. You don't have your hair between your legs, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> no I, well, some people pay for a Brazilian, so. That's true. You're grateful you don't have to pay for that. <laughs> no, I don't. But there's something else that you talked about, which is adding stress. Because there's a lot of people around the world that have their health, that have a great family, that have friends around them, and they're miserable. Well, because they're expecting something else that they don't have. And there is nothing else. You have what you have right now at the moment and don't expect anything more. And I think people live in a lot of disappointment because they think about what they'd like to have or what their neighbor has or something other than what they have this moment. Hmm. And that creates the stress because if there's something out there that you want and you don't have it, that's stress in itself. Right. Well, what's also amazing about <clears throat> that perspective is if you're not happy and grateful for the things that you have now, why on earth do you think you're going to be happy and grateful when you get something you don't have? And how like, do you know you're going to have it? Yeah, like you need to learn how to appreciate everything on the way. Exactly. And until you do that, you're never going to be happy. No. Because you're always going to be expecting something more and wanting something more and then thinking that you deserve more. And that mindset also keeps you from not only appreciating everything that's right in front of you, like the day that you have, but it also makes you, I, somehow it like prevents you from realizing you can create it. Like you can Learn how to wake up every day and be grateful for this day and just put your head down and do the work to create what you want. Be thankful what you do have. Don't think about what you wish you had. I'll always remember, and I think this is true of every little, every child. I used to say, my mother used to say, you know, you're going to wish your life away. Because hmm. we'd say, oh, I wish I could have. I wish I could do. I wish I could go. You know, as a child, we're always wishing she said, you're going to wish your life away. Well, what are you wishing for? Just be grateful for what you have right this minute. Because hmm. who knows what you're wishing for might not be right anyhow. It's true. It's true. And as soon as you wish for something else, you're rejecting what you have. Exactly. Wow. Is there anything else that you want to share or that you can think of or mistakes that you think people make? I think one of the things that I think about when we talk about staying in the moment is that we don't realize that the process that we're going through in life is really the most exhilarating. The best part is the process. It's not getting there. So often, whether you're building a house 
or whether you're going on vacation, it's the process. You think about, oh my gosh, you know, when we go, we're going to do a dude ranch and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. It's the anticipation that's so exciting. Right. And then once you're there, it's like, oh, okay. Um, so it's, it's the wishing. Don't wish for something else. Just be so thankful for what you have right now. If you had to say, because a lot of what we've talked about is how being sedentary impacts you negatively, therefore movement is medicine and any movement is better than no movement. But if you had to frame it in the positive, what are the benefits of having a daily walking practice where you are getting outside and you are taking a walk outside every day? What are all the benefits to doing it? Well, there, there are lots. Uh, and the, the obvious one is to start with is, is how you feel. Uh, you will feel better slowly uh, over the days. Uh, if you've been sedentary and you haven't been moving before, you're going to find it a bit of a, a struggle, perhaps at first when you get walking. But you will, uh, over the course of a few days, you will discover actually you feel pretty good and uh, you miss it when uh, you stop walking and you you will adapt very very quickly um, and the example that i that i give uh, is uh, uh, we can adapt easily to walking 20 or 25 miles a day if we have to it only takes a, a, a week or two to do that but we won't adapt that quickly to running 20 or 25 miles a day you know the equivalent of a marathon a day we can walk the equivalent of a marathon a day day in day out without too much trouble uh, but we can't run the equivalent of a marathon day in, day out, because our bodies are designed for walking uh, and walking together with others, carrying children, carrying food. And we can break uh, a, a walk up into, you know, a, a couple of maybe uh, phases of uh, three or four miles in the morning, another three or four miles in the early afternoon, another three or four miles in, in the evening. Or whatever it happens to be um so we, we adapt very quickly and we we our mood uh adapts uh positively because of mm. that um i think you'll also find in terms of cognition um uh, a kind of a general benefit uh, which is that you will feel a clarity uh of thinking that you might find uh, eludes you otherwise um i think you'll find social benefits um that uh, walking with others are walking and happening to meet others because you know randomly intersecting with your neighbors uh or those familiar strangers uh turns out to be a very good thing for you as well so you you've got all of those kinds of benefits so so those are all kind of quote head centered ones mm. um but then there are lots of others for the other organ systems of the body uh we know for example that uh um uh, things like metabolic disorders, things like type 2 diabetes uh, or heart conditions and those kinds of uh, conditions um, tend to drop off dramatically in people who are active compared to people who are inactive. Uh, so there's a kind of a positive feedback where that's concerned. Um, simple things like if you have a bad back uh, because you're seated all day, uh, rather than taking some pills to try and damp the inflammation down, uh, go for a walk and generate some natural anti-inflammatories, which will <laughs> or act against the inflammation and loosen uh, your back out. And you'll feel an awful lot better uh, from that point of view as well. So, you know, there's a whole constellation of things that happen to mm. uh, be under this one word, which is why I say we're damned by this word, uh, because we've only got one word which covers all of these other things. Are there times when you should walk fast versus walking slow? And what's the difference in terms of the benefits? Um, I, I, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess, again, it depends on your intention where the walk is concerned. You know, if you're walking to enhance heart health, walking fast uh, and walking at a pace where it's difficult to talk to another person, uh, is a really good way of doing that. That's better than jogging slowly. Uh, you're going to be placing more demands uh, on your cardiac system than uh, and your cir circulatory system than you would have been uh, otherwise. Um, so it, it really depends. I, I'm inclined to the view, um, 
and this is just based on personal experience, that if you're trying to think through a difficult problem, if you're trying to engage in creative ideation, that uh, it's hard to do that when you're walking very fast, uh, mm. that walking at a, a slightly lower speed is, is probably uh, uh, the way to go. And then if you're walking with kids, uh, well, then you're going to be walking at the rate that they're walking at. <laughs> so uh, I guess, it, you know, it, it really depends on, on uh, the purpose of your walk. Um, if you're walking, I think, you know, to boost uh, your overall physical health, walking at a good clip is, is what you really need to do. But if you're walking to think something through, probably walking a bit more slowly uh, is probably the, the, the thing to do. And, the, and there's a way to demonstrate that. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, I ask you to uh, engage in a complex addition problem. Uh, okay. You add 17s until you get to 999. Oh, my God. I used to like you, Shane. <laughs> That's hard. Or take 17s away from 1,000. Uh, you can do that when you're walking slowly. Um, you can do it sitting. But if you're walking fast, you'll find your ability to do it drops to zero. Um, uh, I'm sitting here so, so I'm sitting here going, what is a thousand minus 17 right now? <laughs> 983, 987. Nine, no, that's not it. 987, isn't that it? What's that? 93. No, no. 883. No? It's 800 and, sorry, <laughs> you don't have it either. You're, you're putting me off. <laughs> it's 983. Anyway, my, my point is that uh, <laughs> we, we, we can see it here, you know, when we're doing something that imposes a mild uh, mental strain while we're talking to another person under slightly unnatural circumstances, our ability to do a uh, uh, a, a, a simple arithmetical problem drops uh, dramatically as well. So the, my my point really is that if if you're thinking about something, um, probably walking a little bit more slowly um, is fine. But if if you're walking for uh, uh, physiological health, walking more quickly is is the thing to do. Uh, it, it depends on the purpose of the walk. You know what? You're delightful. And if I ever come to Dublin, I hope you'll take a walk with me. Of course. <laughs> y you can even bring your dictator and do your little dictating as we walk. I'll let you do that. Thank you. <laughs> you're very good. <laughs> oh, you're great. You're really great. I learned a lot. I learned a lot and I had a lot of fun. Thank you. I promise to share the five simple steps that I've put into action in my own life. And here they are. Step number one, use the three, two, one rule. The three, two, one rule is very simple. Here it is. Three hours before bedtime, stop eating and drinking alcohol. Two hours before bedtime, stop working. And one hour before bedtime, shut down the screens. You do the three, two, one rule, you're going to get a great night's sleep and you're not going to be so stressed. I'm going to repeat it one more time. This is the three, two, one rule. And it taps into all kinds of research about getting a better night's sleep, about stress, about your mind being able to be calmer so you can get a better night's sleep, and about the impact on screens and blue light on your ability to get a good night's sleep. So here it is. Three hours before bedtime, you're going to stop eating and drinking alcohol. And for me, because I go to bed early, that meant we had to move the dinner time a little bit earlier. Second, two hours before bedtime, stop working. Stop working. One of the reasons why you may have trouble sleeping or relaxing or stopping racing thoughts, or you may be work waking up in the middle of the night, is because you're working too close to your bedtime. So your thoughts are spinning and your stress level is high. So two hours before bed, stop working. And finally, one hour before bed, you got to shut down the screen time. The blue light on your screens, your laptop, your phone, it is interfering with your brain's ability to shut down and sleep. So the three, two, one rule will make a huge difference in your life. Second, this rule I call, how can you make things easier for yourself? Let me unpack this. When I look back on periods of my life where it was a real struggle to stick to habits or to stay calm and confident, it was because I was making my life harder. 
I was relying on willpower or discipline or remembering to do things. And when it dawned on me, hey, there are simple things that you could do, Mel, that would make your life a hell of a lot easier, especially in the morning. There are decisions that you could make at night. There are simple things that you could do in order to take a step in order to move the ball down the field at night so when you wake up in the morning, you don't have to do so much thinking. So let me give you some examples of this. One way that I make my life easier in the morning is every single night I lay my exercise clothes out on the floor in my bedroom or heck, even in the hotel. So I've been on a business trip now. This is day 15 of a business trip hitting six different cities. And I move my body every day. And I know if I'm going to get up at six o'clock in the morning in a hotel, I don't want to be fumbling around in the dark looking for the pair of tights that are actually clean instead of having to turn the clothes inside out to figure out what I could put on my body. Do not do that in the morning. You're creating too much resistance. It requires too much energy and thinking. Make it easier. The night before, as you're walking around your hotel room, brushing your teeth or you're, you know, washing your face or what, just lay your exercise clothes out on the floor. Make it easier. That way they're there for you in the morning. You don't even have to think about it. Isn't that fantastic? And if you've raised kids, how do you make mornings easier with kids? You pack their lunches the night before. You assemble their backpacks by the door. You put their hockey sticks or their tennis rackets or their cleats, the things that they need to remember, right there. For you and me, here's how you can do that for yourself as an adult. Let's say you have a commitment every single morning as part of your morning routine to journal more or to drink more water. Here's a great idea. Put the water bottle filled up by the coffee pot. Put the journal where you're going to do your journaling exercises by the coffee pot. Why? Well, because you're going to make a cup of coffee tomorrow morning. So have it ready there so you don't have to make the cup of coffee and then go, oh, wait a minute, I was going to, where did I put that journal? Is it in the back? Where's the backpack? No, it's right there. Have your things by the door. Put healthy foods in the front of the fridge. Have a little dish that you always put your car keys in. We talked about this concept of make it easier in the episode that we did all about habits. That episode was called Five Essential Hacks I'm Using to Make New Habits Stick. You guys ate that episode up. We will put a link to it in the uh, show notes here. But this, make it easier for yourself. Do it the night before. It's all about something called activation energy. When you lay your exercise clothes out, when you put your water bottle by the coffee maker, when you pack lunches the night before, it takes less energy than having to do it when you're stressed out in the morning. You don't even have to think about it. You've set yourself up for success. And that means you're going to be less stressed. And it means the thing that you might blow off if it's hard in the morning, like exercise, you're more likely to get it done. Why? Because you've made it easier for you. You have supported the new you. How cool is this? It's like a little gift that you're giving yourself. The third rule is give yourself a clean slate. I also like to call this flushing the toilet, okay? Like when you go to bed at night, you flush the toilet when you use it, right? But why? Because you do not want the mess from last night there to greet you in the morning. So why on earth would you do that in your kitchen? Empty the sink, load the dishwasher, clear off the counters, wipe them down. Why? Well, logic. Tomorrow morning, after you wake up and you go to the bathroom, where's the first place we all go in our apartment or our home? We go to the kitchen. Would you rather see a kitchen that has last night's dishes, pots soaking in the sink, and stuff scattered all over the place from yesterday, all of which is unfinished business from yesterday? Or would you? feel more empowered if you walked into the kitchen and the counters were clear and things were organized and there was nothing that you needed to clean up? The answer is obvious. Do not take today's messes into tomorrow. Do not saddle 
the future you with crap that the you today should be doing tonight. And that's always been a huge thing for me because if I walk into the kitchen in the morning and I see a ton of dirty dishes or I see stuff all over the island, it's a trigger. And my day goes downhill because I'm immediately distracted. I'm immediately feeling like everybody's made. I'm immediately feeling like I should have done this last night. I should have put these dishes. Now this, this pot that has been soaking in the sink with all of the, the suds in it, the suds are gone and the water is ice cold and disgusting and oily. I don't wanna put my hands in that and half the stuff hasn't soaked off anyway. And so I didn't make it easier. I actually made it harder and grosser and more disgusting. And now it takes me even more time. So this idea for me of clearing the counters, no dishes in the sink, nothing on the counters, it means I am waking up to a brand new clean slate today, both metaphorically, visually, everything. And so how can you do this? Think about this as, as part of the non-negotiables when you turn off the lights and lock the front door. Do a quick loop through the kitchen and take five lousy minutes to pull it together. Clear off the counters, get everything in the dishwasher, or finish the dishes, get it done. Because I promise you, psychologically, walking into a physically clean slate helps you mentally feel like you've been given the gift of one when you wake up in the morning. Now, the fourth rule, you're going to get intentional about setting your alarm. And here's how you do it. There is no old Mel Robbins going on here. There is no five alarms that you're setting as you coax yourself out of bed. There is no backup plan here. Get intentional. What freaking time do you need to get up? Like for real. Let's not do the fake math that a lot of us do where we think that we can brush our teeth, commute to work, pack three lunches, and finish last night's homework in a matter of 10 minutes. You can't do that, okay? You just can't. So tonight when you set your alarm, I want you to make a decision about the person you are becoming. I'm going to say that again. Tonight when you set your alarm, make a decision about the person you are becoming. Tonight, be very intentional about what you truly need to start your day feeling supported, confident, at ease? How much time do you need to truly put yourself first, take care of your health, and put a little bit of time into something that matters to you? Now, I want to just pause on this for just a second, okay? I think this is where most of us get it wrong that your alarm has probably been set for the same time for years and you haven't stopped to truly think about the person that you're becoming. And when you think about the person that you want to become in this next chapter of your life, what does that person's morning routine look like? How much time do you truly want? And look, I get it. You might have to wake up 45 minutes earlier. I get it. You might not be a morning person. And I'm going to prove to you as we get to know each other, that you don't have to be. You don't have to be a morning person. And you can still create a rock-solid evening routine and a rock-solid morning routine. You don't have to be a morning person. And you can learn and support yourself in getting up 30 minutes earlier because that is how much time you need in order to set your day up for success. And see, I think a lot of us really lose the opportunity of a fresh start and a new morning and the structure of that because we're not intentional and honest with ourselves about what we actually need. And what I've come to learn the more intentional that I get with myself is I need a lot of time in the morning. I need more time than the old Mel Robbins was giving herself because I not only need time to roll out of bed and to brush my teeth and to high five the mirror and to move my body and to uh, set my intention and to make some progress and to do all that before I help Chris or the kids or the dogs or anybody else that works for me or anybody else that follows me or anything else that might be on my phone. 
that I need, actually, if I'm being honest, I need about 90 minutes. I can get it done in 30 in a pinch, but I need about 90 if I don't want to be rushed, if I don't want to be resentful, if I don't want the things that I really need to do so that I can start my day feeling powerful and empowered. That's truly what I need. And you may be thinking, well, that's a luxury. We're not even talking about the morning. I want you to be honest with yourself. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What time do you truly need to wake up to make it easier, to support yourself? What would the future you say? And if you can't think of a time, I'll give you one. Set your alarm one hour earlier than you normally do. Because this is more than a wake-up call. This is more than setting an alarm. What I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to make a promise. Because when you set the alarm clock tonight, what you're really doing is you're making a promise to yourself. You're making a promise that you, when that alarm rings, you're going to wake up, you're going to get up, and you're going to get going. And this is why it's important for you to be intentional, not casual about setting that alarm, but intentional. Because tonight, when you set that alarm clock, you're making a promise. And when you look at it that way, when that alarm rings tomorrow morning, it's about keeping that promise to yourself. That's what the act of waking up becomes that the evening you set up the future you, the tomorrow you, the person you're becoming with a clean slate and a promise for how much time it is that you truly need and deserve every morning. And if you can start to flip how you think about that alarm, how you set it, and what it signals when it sounds in the morning, that future you is here, a promise is there to be kept, it will shift what you think about the opportunities of the morning and the time that you need to truly honor yourself and put yourself first. Now, before we get to the final rule, which is a beautiful rule that you're going to hate like crazy, but it's the most powerful one of all, I need to take a quick break. We're going to hear a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. So don't go anywhere. Hey, it's your friend Mel, and we are talking today about the singular hack that helped me create a rock-solid million-dollar morning routine. And that singular hack, as you now know, is you got to have a rock-solid evening routine. And so we've covered uh, four of the five things that I do. We've talked about the three-two-one rule. We've talked about this mindset flip of how can I make things easier for myself? We've also talked about the importance of giving yourself a physical clean slate so you can have a mental clean slate. Finally, we just covered the importance of getting super intentional about setting your alarm and considering it a promise that you are making and keeping with your future self. And finally, number five, before you tuck yourself in, tuck your phone into the bathroom. That's right. No phone in the bedroom. I want it in the bathroom, in the closet, in the kitchen. Once everything else is handled, the only thing that is allowed on that clear counter in the kitchen is your phone plugged in. Because I have one rule that has changed my life. And that rule is something I do every single evening. It is a critical part of my evening routine. And that is there is no phone in the bedroom, period. And starting tonight, I want you to try this. It's a lot harder than it seems. You are about to realize how addicted you are to your phone. You are also going to see firsthand how it interferes with your ability to have a powerful evening routine. You're also going to see firsthand how it is likely interfering with your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. So before you tuck yourself in, tuck that phone in anywhere but the bedroom. And here's how this is going to work. So all you're going to do is just pick a spot that you're going to charge your phone overnight. 
And for those of you that have um, kids that need to reach you or a job that needs to reach you, I totally get that. I'm the same. So here's how you deal with that. You turn the ringer on and you tell everybody in your life, I don't sleep with my phone, but the ringer is on. If you have an emergency, call me. You will hear the phone ringing in the middle of the night. And what's really interesting ever since I've done this, and I've now done this for years, is that people don't call you in the middle of the night unless it's truly an emergency. But they will text and Snapchat you all night long, and that'll keep you awake. Don't tell me that it doesn't. And so this way you know that you can fall asleep and that somebody can reach you, but you're not going to be distracted by it because it's not going to be near you. So that's number one. If you use your phone as an alarm, excellent. I do too. And the good news about that is that if your phone is outside of the bedroom and it's also your an alarm and it's also your alarm, when it goes off in the morning, you have no choice but to get out of bed. And so I kind of like that hack, even though in the moment I hate that hack when I hear the alarm going off. But you could also just buy a cheap alarm clock or use a watch or something else if you're no longer using your phone as an alarm. So why do I feel this way? I, I feel so strongly about this because you've just spent your entire day letting the whole world have access to you because that's what you're doing when you're watching the news or responding to email or sitting on Zoom calls or you're just scrolling mindlessly through social media. You are allowing the world to steal your attention, to choke your brain power with things that really don't matter. And honestly, there is nothing on your phone that is going to help you sleep tonight. The stuff that's on your phone is going to get you stressed out. It's going to get you worked up. It's going to make you stay awake. And that's why you can't have it near you. You can't trust yourself. And so in order to properly wind down and get a great night's sleep, which you need to do, I won't even get into the research about why you need to start becoming a better sleeper, is we have to get the one thing that's been robbing you of your attention and energy all day away from you. Do not let people have access to you once you get into your bedroom. Do not let the thing that you gave your attention to all day long be the thing that is distracting you at night. You deserve a great night's sleep, and you are just not going to get it if that phone is sitting next to you on the bedside table. And don't lie to me. Like, we're friends at this point. The majority of us sleep with our phones. I, I shouldn't even say us because I do not. But the majority of people, including you, have that phone in your bed. It's right there. You look at it and you want to know something disgusting. A third of people check email in the middle of the night. What are you doing? Email in the middle of the night? Even if you can't sleep, what are you doing? This is sick. And what I will tell you is if that phone is not in that bed with you and it's not on the bedside table and you can't just reach for it because it's a habit for you to reach for it when it bzz and, bzz and buzzes and notifications or because you can't sleep all, oh, just look at my phone. What a stupid idea. Because it's not there, you're not going to do it. And so there's a reason why you're having trouble sleeping. There's a reason why you wake up stressed out. There's a reason why you never have time for yourself. It's because you have shot yourself in the foot before you've even closed your eyes by having that phone there. I think you can tell I'm getting a little worked up. And I'm getting a little worked up because I didn't have to make my life so hard. I didn't have to stress my kids out every day before they climbed on that bus. I didn't have to start my day by yelling at Chris or screaming at the dogs or getting stuck in traffic or starting the day feeling frustrated. I didn't have to do that. And the solution to an empowering morning and to feeling supported starts with how you show up for yourself the night before. It is really that simple. And I'm frustrated because I wasted so many years of my life by making things way more difficult than they needed to be. If I had just gotten serious about these five simple things that I do now, I would have felt more in control. I would have been a lot more calm. I would have felt like I was a good mom and a supportive partner. I wouldn't have felt so much frustration. Like there's just so much available to you if you get serious tonight. And I love all of these changes, whether you're going to implement the three, two, one rule. And one way that you could do that is to put an alarm in your phone. 
that counts you down. You could put post-it notes on the fridge to remind you about this stuff. But I want you to try it. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.